Greetings and welcome to all of you who woke up early this morning. My name is Chris Nkumana and you're listening to the Kanguka Broadcast. Today is Thursday and you know that for the last several weeks I've been talking to the parents who have children who are of age to get married. Then I started talking to the young men and women who are of age to get married. And this morning I want to continue to talk to them. Let me do a quick review of what we've already said to the young men. If you're new to the broadcast, please listen to the last few Thursday broadcasts so you can hear the topics that we've already discussed. Last week, I told you that a young man who's of age to get married should leave his parents' home. You can't consider getting married if you are still being fed by your parents. If you're still living in your parents' home and you still depend on your parents, it means that you are not ready to get married. I told you that young men who want to get married should live on their own first. They must leave their parents' home. Let me be clear that this doesn't apply to girls. I'm talking specifically to the young men. You need to leave your parents' home. If you still depend on your father and your mother, then you're not ready to get married. The word of God says that you will leave your father and your mother and you will be joined to your wife and you shall become one flesh. A man has to leave the house of his father and his mother in order to go and then get the wife that God had prepared for him. So you must first leave your parents' home. You have to live on your own. You have to pay your own rent, you have to feed yourself. If you still can't pay your own rent, you still can't feed yourself, it means that you are still not ready to get married. You should pray first and you should wait. But if you feel that it's time to get married, I want all the young men who are listening to me to know that you must first leave your parents' home, you must live on your own, you need to become a man before you get married. Don't seek to get married by faith while you're still being fed by your parents. I keep repeating this because you need to understand that a man must first leave his parents so he can be joined to his wife. The Bible never says that a girl must leave her parents. It never says that she must leave her father and her mother. This instruction is only for men. At the end of last Thursday's broadcast, I was speaking to the men and women who are engaged and who are getting ready to be married. There is a girl that you want to marry. You have prayed and you have a confirmation from God that she is the right person. And the girl also has the confirmation that you are the man that God has chosen for her. You both know that God is with you, but there is a problem because the parents are against the marriage. This is an issue that often happens with parents of the girl. The girl wants to marry you, but her parents are against it. As I told you last week, the parents of the girl can refuse to approve the marriage of their daughter for many reasons. They can refuse because they don't like your ethnic background or your family background. They can refuse because you don't have enough money or because you don't have the education level that they want. But as I told you last week, you should never fight in the flesh. You should fight in the spirit through prayer. You need to understand that the father of the girl must give you her hand in marriage. You can't take her by force. You can't ignore the father of the girl and say, he doesn't understand, he's not saved, he doesn't know God, I know what God told me. And then you take matters into your own hands and you take her by force. If you do that, it means that you've opted to follow a path that contrary to the word of God. The father of the girl or her family has to agree to give you the hand of the girl in marriage. Then you need to get on your knees and pray. You need to believe that the God who promised you that girl is able to convince her parents. You can't tell me that God is not able to handle the father of the girl or her family. Let me tell you that the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. If God was able to soften Pharaoh's heart and to harden it again later on, he's more than able to soften the hearts of the parents of the girl so they can allow you to get married in the proper way and you can avoid falling into sin and endless disputes thanks to prayer. It may take a short time or a long time, but you need to wait. My advice to you is that you should never take matters into your own hands. You need to pray and God will fulfill his promise. If God truly promised you that girl, he will give her to you in a proper way. He will convince the parents because nothing is impossible with God. God willing, I will continue this topic next Thursday.
We are now in the second part of the broadcast and we are going to continue the teaching called Prayer and Supplication. I want you to know that any contribution you make to support God's work is important. You are not wasting your money. Your contribution is important and you can remind God about it when you are making supplications. And this isn't limited only to your own good works. Even if you are praying for another person and you are aware of some good works that this person has done, you can lift up those good works before for God. Maybe that person is helping many people to repent from their sins and to get saved. You need to mention those good works because they do exist. Whenever you are aware of some good works, you should always lift them up before God. Yesterday, I was saying that you can stand on good works that don't exist. If you never do anything, if you never help anyone, if your income is spent on yourself and on your close family members, you don't help anyone else, you don't help any orphan or any widow, you don't provide any support to God's work, everything is centered on you and on you alone. So if you pray and you ask God to rescue you from your problems, but you have nothing that you can stand on, you have nothing that you can lift before God, it means that you're just making a regular prayer and you're not making a supplication. You can't make a supplication if you have nothing to stand on. Your supplication must be based on something. That's why many people go before God and all they do is just crying and complaining and accusing God. They say, why have you abandoned me? You have forgotten me. But you need something that you can stand on because your good works speak loud. The good works that Dokas has done were speaking loud. There were many widows who were surrounding the body of Dokas in that room, but their hands were not empty. We saw in Acts chapter 9 verse 39 that each one of them was showing the tunics and the garments that Dokas had made for them. Maybe some were showing the clothes that they were wearing that day, and others were showing clothes that they were holding in their hands. But all the widows were showing to Peter the clothes that Dorcas had made for each one of them. After Peter heard them, verse 4 he says that he put them out and he went on his knees and he prayed. Then he said, Tabitha arise, and she came back to life. Please read verse 41 carefully. It says that he gave her his hand and he lifted her up. Then he called the saints, meaning the disciples who were there, he called the saints and the widows. So why did he call the widows? He called the widows because they are the ones who made the miracle possible. He thanks to them that Tabitha came back to life. Peter was able to base his prayers on the good works that Tabitha had done for those widows and those good works gave special strength to his prayers. If God is using you for some good works, then later on when you are praying for the problems that you are facing, you should lift up your good works before God because your good works speak loud and they will give strength to your prayers. Many people don't know about this. If you are praying for someone who's doing good works for God, don't just say, God, rescue him, God, help him. No, you need to mention his good works. You should say, God, look at all those people that he's helping. Look at all the efforts he's making so he can preach the gospel. Look at all the people who are getting saved thanks to him. Look at all the orphans and widows that he's helping. Look at his generous heart. Look at the sacrifices he's making for the sake of your people. When you say words like this, they rise up before God and they give power to your prayers. But the problem is that many people don't know how to pray for people who are doing good works. When they pray for them, they say, God help him. God have mercy on him. Have compassion on him. It's true that God is full of mercy and compassion, but he also abides by his principles. That's why you need to mention those tangible works. Those widows were showing the clothes that Dokas made and that was a picture of tangible works. If you want your prayers to have power, you need to start doing good works. It's very important to stand on the word of God. It's very important to stand on the promise that God made. But right now, I'm talking about standing on good works that you have done. If you are helping people to come to Jesus, if you are helping the poor and you are contributing to their well-being, if you support God's work in one way or another, if you support the preaching of the gospel, you need to mention all those good works when you are praying for your problems. When you are praying and you are asking God to rescue you, you need to remind God about all the people that you rescued. If you do that, your prayers will be powerful. God willing, we continue tomorrow. May I am bless you. I wish you a great day.
If you want to repent or you're transformed by these teachings, you can contact us by sharing your testimony in order to edify other listeners by contacting us on plus two five six seven eight one three seven seven three three seven.